Uh, hey everyone, welcome back. This is our, I think, last chunk of chapter one. And this is all about how matter changes. So how can you turn an atom into a compound, or maybe a compound back into atoms or elements, which are the same thing. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is the one that's a little bit easier, the one that's definitely more well used, and that's physical changes or physical transformations. So physically, if you change, you're the same thing before and after. As is the case for water, you could think of water starts out as a solid, you warm it up, it turns into a liquid, you keep warming it up, it vaporizes into a gas, but it was still water in the solid form as it was in the liquid form as it is later in the gas form that we would call, say, humidity in the end. So as we look at examples of this, that's really what we're after is some of those definitions you probably saw in middle school. So one of the cases that we're looking for here would be uh, freezing and melting. So you freeze something, it would turn it into a solid. But if you could melt it, you could reverse it. So that's a great way to know the difference. Physical changes can oftentimes be reversed, especially with these kinds of definitions here. So if you can uh, freeze a popsicle, you can melt it. If you can vaporize water, you can condense it. This is what happens almost every night uh, in the summertime. The humidity in the air um, is there. We can feel it. Nice, you know, thick, humid Missouri kind of day. But then as soon as the sun goes down, that humidity starts moving slower. And those molecules, as they start moving slower, start to now collect to each other. And when they do that, uh, they can condense on the grass, on the roses, that kind of idea where we get to do. Sublimation is one that's a little bit more rare to think about. There's not many things that can sublime that are easily known by most people. Uh, three common examples would be things like carbon dioxide can sublime. You can take solid dry ice, dry because there's no puddle. If there's no puddle, there's no melting. Uh, you go straight from a solid to a gas directly, so it just kind of vanishes into thin air because there was a white brick of, you know, powdery solid. And then all of a sudden it's just gone. It's just disappeared. And because it was dry the entire time, we call it dry ice, but it was carbon dioxide before and after. Deposition would be the reverse. This is what happens in the wintertime. So if I were to go outside right now, uh, it being in January, uh, it's very common that that humidity in the air, which there isn't much this particular season of the year, but when there is, it can get very cold very quick so that when the sun comes down, it doesn't have a chance to condense. It just goes immediately to what we call frost, which would be deposition. In the morning, it's more likely that it warms up slowly, so it does eventually uh, melt before it vaporizes and goes back into the atmosphere again. Um, but deposition is a good way to recognize frost on a very cold night. So as we look at some examples, think about this idea, could it be reversed? So if the sun turns snow into water, could that be reversed? Well, we could get cold again, right? might be more complicated to think about how it could get back to snow in that form again. But if snow is just frozen water and we tell, turn it into melted water, we could reverse that pretty easily. If you evaporate gasoline, so if you spill some gas in your garage, it disappears. Could it reappear? Well, that's difficult to think about because it's going to spread out. You're going to smell it because it's spreading out. It's going to diffuse in the air. You might think about it being very difficult to go backwards, but if it was in a closed environment, if you evaporated gasoline, you could condense it back because evaporation is a key word for physical change. If dry ice vanishes into the air, could it reappear? Well, again, it's going to be difficult to think about how to get CO2, but if you were to collect CO2 and compress it, you could get it back into its solid form. Um, we have one of those machines uh, on our canvas. Iodine vapor turns into a solid on a cold surface. So if it's a vapor that turns to a solid, it can be reversed and turn back into a vapor. That's a type of uh, sublimation. Iodine is what you can smell in hospitals because it's so easy to sublime from its antiseptic solutions. And then if you're very uh, familiar with air conditioning, freon gas can cool to form a liquid, but it can also, uh, so that's condensation, but when it evaporates, that 
process of condensation and evaporation over and over again. That's how we get things to uh, cool or to heat, depending on which um, idea we take advantage of. So if the sun is turning a solid into water, that's what we're going to be uh, called melting. Evaporation is the same thing as vaporization. Uh, if you're vanishing, never making a puddle, that's sublimation. And then iodine vapor itself, again, is deposition because in this situation, um, it was already a vapor. It's reversing itself into a solid uh, on a cold surface. That's something we'll see in our first experiment. And then freon gas. Anytime you cool a liquid, it's going to attract together and condense. That's the opposite of what happens when the sun comes up when it vaporizes. One of the most common issues that we have with physical changes is a lot of students associate a physical appearance change with a physical change, and that's not what we want. If you physically look different, it's because you are different, and that's a chemical change, and that's something that students just don't like because the word physical should mean physical, and if you physically look different, why is that not a physical change? Because you're changing your physical appearance. Well, if you're changing your physical appearance, it's because you're adding new atoms or elements to make you look different. And that's going to be chemical, not physical. One way to check that we're physically still the same is physical properties. If you have a specific melting point, it shouldn't change. If it changes, it's probably because something else is mixed in, so there's some kind of solution. So water melts at zero. It boils at 100, but if we were to add antifreeze to that water, it would probably change its color for one. But if not, it would change its boiling points and melting points for sure. And that's why we do it. So even though we call it antifreeze, it's actually anti-boil. Uh, we'll learn about that later in the semester. It's kind of like saying in the next two that if somebody handed you water with color, handed you, you know, some yellow snow, it would be different than normal snow. And that's because color changes things. If it has a new color, it's because something new has been added to it, and that would be some kind of new mixture. Um, whether that could be reversed or not is dependent on the example. But typically, if you look a different color, it's probably because something has changed chemically within you. If somebody hands you a glass of water but it has a taste, it's probably not water. Um, if it has a smell, it's probably not water, because those smell molecules, those taste molecules, are going to be different if it doesn't taste like water, if it tastes like something else. So be careful. If you change your physical properties, it's a great chance you change your chemical composition altogether. If we're a chemical change, uh, typically can't be reversed. One of the things that's harder to think about, though, with some of those kind of intermediate examples would be like if you have an aspirin and you crush it up and put it into a patient's mashed potatoes, is it still an aspirin? Well, yes. Could you get that aspirin back? Well, it'd be tough to think about how to get it back from mashed potatoes, but... Because it is aspirin before and after the powder form and the solid form, you could put it in a pellet press and get it back to the pellet before it was added to the mashed potatoes or so forth. Kind of like breaking a window. If you break a window with a baseball, it might look like a window um, before but not after, but it's still glass. It's still just pieces of glass. So changing its shape overall is another type of physical change that we don't want to confuse with now chemical change, even if it's something that's more difficult to think about reversing. Chemical changes, you're very different before and after, and the only way to go backwards, the only way to be somewhat reversible is to go through a separate chemical change to get backwards, and that's not always the case for everything. So when you combine hydrogen and oxygen to make water, you have to use electricity to separate it, to dissociate it later. Um, these are kinds of things that cannot easily be reversed without um, you know, an outside kind of either equipment or process or chemical change in this case. So again, here's a couple examples of how to recognize that difference. The biggest clue here is, could you reverse it or could you not? So if you take aspirin and you grind it into a powder, it's still aspirin before and after. It's just in a different shape. So changing shape is still physically the same. So that's definitely a physical change. If sulfur is burning into a blue flame, it's uh, combining with oxygen in the air to burn, so it's going to be a uh, combustion process. Um, this kind of combustion or this burning process uh, is definitely a good verb, a good word to recognize a chemical change.
Silver nitrate forms a white solid in tap water. So this is what happens when silver nitrate finds chloride ions that have been used in purified water from, say, a sink. This ability to make silver chloride is a precipitate that we'll learn about later in the semester, and precipitates are great ways to recognize new compounds through chemical changes, which is the title of that chapter. So anytime we make a new compound that has a new color, silver nitrate is clear, but if it makes something white, it's because it's made something new, and that's a chemical change. When a banana ripens, it changes its color. Color change is a great way to recognize it, just like production of a gas or production of a precipitate or causing heat or light. Those are all ways that we'll see in class um, and in lab that are great ways to recognize chemical transformations, chemical changes. Aluminum is recycled, so if you take an aluminum can, you can melt it. You can make it into a new one. So the life of some Pepsi cans is they can be melted down and turned into Coca-Cola cans later. And that's definitely a physical change. So think about changes in shapes, those definitions of melting, freezing, vaporizing, condensing, uh, sublimation, deposition. Those are the easiest ways using those uh, six definitions. But again, changing shape is a good one because it's still the same. It's just in a different shape. But if it makes something new, it makes a new color, it makes heat, it makes light. Uh, those are ways to look for chemical transformations instead. So here's an example of matter uh, in the form of sodium. Sodium is a shiny metal, although you have to store it in kerosene because it likes to oxidize very quickly with oxygen to make sodium oxide or even sodium hydroxide as a white kind of fluffy coating. Uh, but what's unique about sodium is if you were to put a tablespoon in your mouth, it's not like salt. It's not in the ionized form yet. It is just raw sodium metal. It's going to react with the moisture in your mouth, produce hydrogen gas so quickly that it's going to want to explode along with your head into pieces, which is not what we want. Chlorine gas, uh, very toxic gas, um, can react with water to make uh, hydrochloric acid. And last thing you want is the same acid that eats cement off of bricks being in your lungs or on your face, interacting with the moisture of your eyes, and definitely dangerous there, very acidic, very corrosive, give you lots of blisters and so forth on your skin tissues. So both very, very dangerous together. And if you watch other YouTube videos, you'll see this kind of demonstration done over popcorn because when you mix two elements together, they chemically change into what we see in this case is table salt. So something that we can put on our popcorn and now eat afterwards, where if we were to eat the ingredients of the salt, we would definitely die in, you know, in both cases for sodium and for chlorine gas. So the take-home message here is your elements are very different. Um, from your compounds, different properties, because they're different things. In chemical reactions, what we have is uh, what looks like a sentence, and that's what makes chemistry so difficult. It uses math and English together. Um, so subjects you probably dislike on your own, but now put them together, you get science. Uh, in a chemical reaction, you have reactants in the front. That's a lot like your subject. The arrow is the mixing together process. That's the verb. And then after the arrow is the products, that's the predicate, so to speak, of, of an English sentence. And that's very common that we'll see that later in the semester. One thing useful about matter is we can see it's changing or lack of changing through a chemical reaction. So look for physical states to be in parentheses, uh, typically in italics, not always, but usually, usually in a smaller font, depending on the, the uh, author of the chemical reaction. So if you can see physical changes, oftentimes things before and after they will look identical, just the physical state of matter will change. So as we look at a couple of these examples, notice the first one, we have the element phosphorus and oxygen combining to make something new. That's chemical because what's on the left side is different from what's on the right side. Uh, and the second one, we have water going to water. So because it's H2O before and after, that's definitely physical. The ability to see that it's a gas to a liquid tells us that would be a condensation process of the physical change itself. Uh, very close is O2 and O3, but it's not, um, you know, horseshoes or hand grenades where close matters, they are different. O2 is very different from O3. O2 is what we breathe for oxygen. O3 is a protective layer called ozone in the atmosphere. Um, very different having that extra atom. And that's what makes that one chemical. 
So if you're not identical before and after in the subject and the verb and the reactants and the products, then you're going to be a chemical change because you're going to be different before and after. So let's talk about scientific method in a separate video. Um, so we'll have one more installment for this chapter, and we'll see you then.